Well, if you know me, you know that I have three kids that I love very much. Each one of them is special and unique, and I get to share something different with each one of them. Actually, can you hold on one second? Because I just need to get a little bit more comfortable this morning. Ah, much better. See, one of the things that I share with my son is a love for superhero and science fiction movies. Uh, Noah and I really enjoy those stories, and here I am wearing a t-shirt from one of my favorite superheroes, The Flash. So that's just my demonstration of something that I love and that I share with Noah. Uh, I can also get pretty geeky about Star Wars and Star Trek, which, contrary to my teenage daughter's belief, are not the same thing. So several months ago, my son and I, we were reading these books about making origami puppets out of characters that you like. And so Noah became obsessed with making puppets of his own. And uh, I wanted to show you a picture of just a few of the ones he's made. I don't actually know how many he has. We didn't take the time to count, but he told me that as of a few months ago, he had made over 100 puppets from Star Wars, uh, Marvel Comics, and DC superheroes like Superman and Batman. Now, I'm a big fan of these characters, and I'll read readily admit to you that I like sci-fi and superhero shows and series and stories because they're an escape for me. They're a place I like to go for a story that I know I will enjoy. I like the spaceships, I like the time travel, I like the advanced technology and the superhuman abilities. And I'm sure that my son Noah agrees with those things because like his dad, he likes to spend time imagining those worlds and everything that comes along with them. In recent months, our world has sometimes been difficult to face. It can be tempting to us to, to escape reality to run off and watch a show or a movie where fantastic things happen and all the problems can be saved in the space of 60 minutes, or it can be solved rather. It's easier to do that sometimes than it is to chart a course for the coming week of real life. And you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying stories. But when the 60 minutes ends, when the show's over or the movie's over, what story are we going to write in the real world? How are we going to tackle the problems facing our families and our neighbors? It can really feel like sometimes the weight of the world is on our shoulders and we don't have the superhuman strength to hold it all together. In fact, I don't actually know anyone with superhero abilities, but I know something that we do have, each one of us. What we have is a calling from Jesus to make a difference in the world. Now, it might seem like that would be easier if we could put on a cool costume and bend steel with our bare hands, but God has an even better and more personal idea in mind. So let's start there. We're going to look today at Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 14. Look at it with me. Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. I want you to say that with me for a moment. You are the light of the world. Ready? Say it with me. You are the light of the world. In recent weeks, we've been blessed to hear from people like Tony Brubaker and Jonathan Bornman and Pastor Carl, who talked about what it means to pursue peace. And that plays right into what we're talking about today. Because the same Jesus who said, blessed are the peacemakers, is the one who said, you are the light of the world. All the things that Jesus told us to do, they all go together. Our lives are not compartmentalized that as if we would do church on one day and school on one day and work on one day and all those things live separately and independently from each other. They all go together and all the things that Jesus told us to do all go together as well. The things he taught and the things that God is saying to us about how we are to live. You are 
the light of the world. And that means all the time. That means you carry the light into every situation, into every relationship, into your politics, into your Facebook timeline and your Instagram story. You are the light of the world no matter where you are and what you're doing. Now for a moment I want to clarify something for you because the world is a big place. And Jesus did say, you are the light of the world. But see, he wasn't just speaking to you, Rebecca, or to you, John. He was speaking to me. And he was speaking to the person sitting next to you. And he's speaking to everyone who loves him. He was speaking to the person watching this sermon online. He wants us together to be the light of the world. So that means you are the light of your world, the street you live on, the school you go to, the followers you have online, the people you interact with there, the office you work in, the family you have. You are the light in that world, in all the circles where you have influence. And if all of us carry the light of God's love to the people in our world, the circles around us, well then guess what? That's how we together are the light of the whole world. You don't have to carry the weight of the whole world on your shoulders because we're in this together. But my friends, if we want to do a good job at being the light of the world, then we have to fight for it. Now stick with me, because I'm not saying that we have to fight people. Instead, we have to fight not to get trapped by things that take our eyes off the goal. You know, I have sometimes thought that if I could be a superhero, if I could have superhuman abilities, one of my favorite things about being a superhuman would be that I could eat whatever I want and never gain weight. But the danger of that, and I'm just speaking honestly here, the danger is that I might use that ability and all my time visiting donut shops and ice cream parlors and actually miss a chance to save the world. See, we have to fight not to get trapped by things that want to take our eyes off the goal. In other words, people spend a lot of time fighting for what they want or for what they think is right rather than fighting to be the light. A couple of weeks ago, Tony talked to us about building bridges, and I love that illustration. I mean, it can be difficult, though, to build bridges and live at peace when people, when we all have different views and opinions. I mean, just go to the grocery store and notice how many people will and won't wear face masks right now. No matter where you are on that particular question or what side of the issue you're on, it's a good example of how some of the things we face in our world today can get in the way of building bridges. If you disagree with someone on a hot button topic, something COVID related or politics related or racial and justice issues, whatever, can you really still be at peace with them? Can you grow in your relationship with them? Can you share the light of God's love with them? You know, it's so obvious right now that our world, even our individual world is divided because we see every day political issues have got people calling each other names and villainizing each other. Racial justice issue, issues have people crying out for change and, for, and they're dealing with open-minded and closed-minded responses to that. And this pandemic we're in has created a whole spectrum of opinions on how organizations and individuals should be handling public safety. Now, where do these divides come from? Why don't we all see things the same way? Well, Without getting too much into the psychology and the sociology of it and knowing that I can't possibly explain all the things that create these difficulties, you know, it occurred to me this week that we Americans are blessed with a huge amount of freedom. That's one of the things we love about living here in the U.S. and it's actually one of the things our country was founded on. But at the same time, I'm not sure that our freedom means exactly what we think it means sometimes or everything that we think it means. Freedom can cause us problems if we misuse it. For example, number one, freedom is not total dependence from one another. Sometimes we're so busy trying to get our own way and fighting for what we think is right that we do it at the expense of someone else. We really need each other and we just can't do whatever we want all the time without affecting each other. If Jesus really meant what he said about loving your neighbor, then we have to be ready to put the needs of others before our own. 
See, freedom is not total independence from one another. And secondly, freedom is not a right to devalue other people. The things we say about other people and the way we act toward them matters, even when we disagree with them. I hear people every day talking in ways that devalue someone who's different than them in belief or in appearance or throwing insults for any number of reasons. Some people are so wrapped up in their own freedoms and their own rights that when faced with discomfort or disagreement, they end up reacting in anger, defensiveness, or hurtfulness. And all that shows is that we're really more concerned about ourselves than others. But freedom is not a right to devalue other, pe other people. What did Jesus say? Say it with me. You are the light of the world, right? And that means that God's light is going to be more important to you than the whole world, than what you think about anything going on in the world today. Because the only way to be the light is to keep fighting for it. It has to be your number one priority. We have to be willing to get rid of the distractions and focus on who God has called us to be. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus met a man that the Bible just calls the rich young ruler. Why does it call him that? Well, because that's pretty much all that we know about him. So this guy comes to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because that's what you've been talking about, Jesus, and I want that. So tell me what I have to do. And at first, Jesus answers, well, you know the commandments, and he lists them off. Follow these commandments. I think Jesus already knew the answer that the man would give. And the man says, I do those things. I've done that my whole life. Then look in verse 22. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when, when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. Friends, you and I are very rich. Not only do we have the freedom of living in the United States, we have the wealth that comes along with it. But this message isn't just about material wealth, and I know that's not all that Jesus was saying here either. See, Jesus is saying to this man, don't hold on to your stuff. You're asking me for eternal life and you're worried about your stuff? My friends, what is your stuff? Is it your home? Is it your wardrobe? Is it your political beliefs? Is it your fear? What is the stuff? What is the thing in your life that you're willing to fight for or fight about? The stuff that you aren't willing to let go of. Even if Jesus were to stand in front of your face and say to you, this is the one thing you have left to do. The one thing you need to stop clinging to if you want to experience real freedom. We're not at the end of this message yet, but I want to take a moment right now and pause and ask you to ask God and listen for his voice. Is there stuff I'm holding on to? Something I'm fighting for that keeps me from being the light, being the one that God made me to be. Let's take just a moment and ask God, is there something that is getting in the way? Is there stuff in my life that I need to let go of? Well, Pastor Carl has recently talked a lot about how the kingdom of God operates differently than the system of the world. And we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and we're meant to operate according to its rules and its power. But this world 
is the one that we know because it's the one that we live in. And every day we hear messages about what we should think or what we should do, how to be a successful person or how to be on the right side of history or just how to be happier. You know, as I see all these things going on around us, I think somebody needs to stand up for Jesus, for what it means to be like Jesus. Because there's a thousand different messages every day about what it means to be self-fulfilled or self-actualized. When Jesus says, I want you to be the light of the world, he wants us to be like him. We don't need what the world gives. We don't need more happiness. We need more Jesus. We don't need more money. We need more Jesus. We don't need to put our hope in anything or anyone but Jesus. Because being the light of the world means that we will be empowered and equipped to engage with this world the way that Jesus would. And that is what makes the difference. The Bible tells us that Jesus poured out his life in order to do what? To bring glory to the Father, to destroy the power of sin, and to lead us into a relationship with God. And that is the same calling that Jesus gave us when he said, you are the light of the world. We pick up where he left off. Jesus finished the work for us. Now we carry the message of that work into the lives of other people. We are the light of the world. We give up the stuff that gets in our way. We experience real freedom and we help others to find it as well. Now we talked about what freedom isn't, but what is freedom? What, God, what does God have to say about it? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Dropping down to verse 13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And he goes on in the next verse to repeat Jesus's words. The whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Paul's saying here in verse one, don't get trapped. Just like we were saying earlier, don't get trapped in slavery to the law. When Paul talks about the law, he's referring to these religious rules that were designed to help people get closer to God, to appear righteous and to, to earn their salvation. You know, Paul's saying to us, don't get trapped in slavery to the law. The things you're doing, even though you might be doing them with the right intention, if you're doing something that's designed to make you righteous because you think you have to earn your way to God, then don't do that. God's love doesn't work that way. We don't work our way into heaven. We don't have to do something to earn our freedom. God gives us freedom and then expects us to do something with it. He says, you're called to live in freedom. And that means you serve one another in love. It's the natural response. And as I look around the world today and I see how people, even Christians, even my brothers and sisters, how we have treated one another, we have fallen far short of being the light. And God is calling us to be the light of the world today to stand up for Jesus, for what it means to be like him. Not to fight for what's right, but to fight for the light. My friends, this is our superhero moment. One of my favorite superheroes is actually from the kids program, Veggie Tales. Do you remember Larry Boy? Larry Boy would say, I am that hero. And that's what God is asking us to say in this very moment. Not because of any super abilities of our own, but because we carry the light of God's love. And that means we serve one another in love. God has given us his super abilities to care for people in need, to point them toward a relationship with him, and to bring glory to God just like Jesus did. 2 Timothy tells us God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-discipline. 
I asked my son Noah if he would make me for this week a special puppet to demonstrate all that we're talking about, about being the light of the world. And here's what he came up with. He calls this guy light of the world. And this guy has all the colors of the rainbow on his suit. And all the colors of the rainbow is what light is made of. So I love that illustration. I asked him to make the rest of the outfit yellow because it reminds me of a bright light. And Noah also told me that he wanted to make the puppet look something like Jesus. My friends, we are called to look like Jesus. You are the light of the world. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that they will glorify your Father in heaven. Don't fight for what's right. Fight to be the light. This kind of fight doesn't set up any human being as our enemy. It says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be more like Jesus, and that will change the world. Let's pray together. God, help us to want only the things that you say are important and not to get trapped and tied up in things that don't matter. Sometimes even when we want to do what's right, we fall short because we don't depend on you. So right now we put our dependence on you and our trust in you. You call us to be the light of the world, so keep working to transform us into who you want us to be. Help us to respond to all the turmoil around us by loving people first. Right now, Lord, will you bring to our mind the person we know that we need to work on loving this week to bring the light to? Speak to our hearts. And one more prayer. If you haven't answered the call of Christ in your own life, I ask you to take the time right now to commit yourself to following him. Just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Forgive me for doing life my own way and lead me in the way I should go. And Lord, you'll get all the glory from our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.